can be helpful at the beginning, but sometimes uh, the danger of stages or steps of meditation um, can be that one gets stressed out at trying to progress. Many times people have said they've read some of the books where they did really put down some of those stages very clearly. And they say, I'm on step three. And then I have to ask them, actually, what is step three? Well, you wrote the book, but I say that sometimes you change it because these little steps which we, we make sometimes is really sort of halfway to that step or all the way to that step, what happens afterwards. So first of all, please don't interpret these steps or stages of meditation as something you have to stress out to and something you have to have confirmation. Now, what step am I on? What stage am I on? Because a lot of times, all these steps really say that landmarks on the path to letting go. As more and more things disappear, the mind gets more and more refined. And you want to kind of describe these as stages and steps. But quite frankly, like there's stages and steps. If you want to go from London to, to Edinburgh, yeah, there's stages on the journey. But, you know, what do those stages really mean? Every time I travel and go, say, from Australia to England, on the maps, they've got all these lines between the different countries. And also, they do color the countries different colors. But, you know, up in an aircraft, you've seen this, when you look down on the ground, you can't see red colors or brown colors or, or pink colors. No, you do that because it makes it a little bit more interesting for people to understand. And nevertheless, a path of meditation, like the path of travel from Australia to London, is just a smooth journey. You get closer and closer and closer. And that's the same with meditation. It's a smooth journey as you let go more and more and more and get more and more peaceful. But nevertheless, because they asked you know, for the stages of meditation, you can so sort of describe them in a way which as long as people don't try to attain those stages and get them, they're landmarks on the journey, things which you can see happening in your meditation practice. And I would also say one thing which I learned from Ajahn Chah, he kept on saying this again and again and again. He emphasized that we meditate not to attain things or to get somewhere. We meditate to let go of things, not to get somewhere, to become more and more invisible, to become more and more to disappear, to lose more things, not gain more things. And that's a struggle for many people because human beings in our modern societies are almost conditioned to want to gain things, to get more. Okay, you've tried that in the material world, but now we want to get these things in the spiritual world. There was something that you know, Chogram Trungpa used to say, many of his behavior was really reprehensible. But one of the things he said, which was wise, was that the idea of spiritual materialism. See how deep we can go in the meditation and then tell your friend, oh, I'm in this deep stage of meditation. What stage are you in? Oh, I'm much deeper than that. So please don't use these stages of meditation as a way of increasing your ego. Use them as just a nice little guideline to see how much you have let go. So now we start off with the stages of meditation of just being aware. This is one of the reasons why the awareness, mindfulness, has to be developed and has to be strengthened. It's the first stage in any meditation path. So, what is mindfulness? And of course, ever since mindfulness became a product uh, which people can sell to others and claim all sorts of benefits and advantages from, it does make it very difficult to explain what real mindfulness is. And so, my definition of mindfulness is it has to be in this present moment. And I'm not just uh, stealing this from Eckhart Tolle. This was straight from the Buddha's teaching thousands of years before. Our problem as Buddhist monks is we don't um, 
what's it called? We don't, uh, no, don't appropriate. We don't um, go to the, what's it when you, you have a new idea and you get oh, the, patent. patent, yeah. We don't patent any of these con uh, ideas. We let everybody make use of them <clears throat> for the benefit of all beings. So, but anyway, the mindfulness started with Buddhism and it's right there in the suttas. And it starts with what we call this present moment awareness, just being here. Because if you are aware of the past, then you don't know what's happening now. If you are you know, obsessed with the future, again, you can't see what's happening in this present moment. You're not a mindful at all. So that simple idea of being in this moment, this present moment, that's one of the first definitions of, mind, of mindfulness. And the second definition of mindfulness, where it goes deeper, is in the silence of the mind. And the usual simile which I give, and you may have heard it so many times, but it's the best simile which I've ever heard, was, was of that uh, Zen teacher, uh, Lao Tzu, not Zen teacher, sorry. He was a Taoist teacher. And he would have a number of students with him in the monastery in China. And every evening he would go on a walk with only one disciple. And they had to keep silence throughout that walk. That was a golden rule. And so he chose one new disciple and they went for a walk up into the mountains in a couple of hours. And they came to a ridge in the mountains at sunset. There was a gorgeous sunset. And the disciple on his first walk with the master, he broke the golden rule. He exclaimed you know, in awe, wow, what a beautiful sunset. And the teacher didn't respond, otherwise he would break the rule as well. He just turned around, walked back to the monastery. When they got back to the monastery, he said to everybody else, that student broke the rule. He cannot go on a walk with me ever again for life. And the friends of this young student tried to intercede on the student's behalf. That's a bit too tough. He only said, what a beautiful sunset. What's wrong with that? And then the master gave the answer. And it was the answer which has been impressing me ever since I first read it when I was a student at Cambridge. The master said, when my student said, what a beautiful sunset, he was not aware of the sunset anymore. He was just watching the words. And you know, I don't know about you, but I got that straight away. The description is an imperfect representation of the truth. So imperfect and misses way too much. So if you're really going to be mindful and see something, feel something, know something, you have to be silent for you to really be aware of what you are watching. And all this idea of noting, quite frankly, that you know, I don't agree with that at all, that's not there in the suttas, that's not how the Buddha taught meditation, that noting, of course, is deceptive. And to give you an example of that, for those who haven't heard me say this before, there was a very wealthy woman who came to the Bhikkhuni Vihara in Oxford to uh, listen to some of the amazing talks by uh, Venerable Chanda here. But she came from a very wealthy part of Oxford. And so she told her gatekeeper, please be aware Watch over my house. There are many dangerous people in Oxford. Is that right? <laughs> so, and the guard said, don't worry, madam. Go and enjoy the temple. I look after the house. I will be mindful. I'll be trained in mindfulness. Okay, said the owner. And she went off to the Rihara and listened to an amazing talk. And when she went home, what happened? She found her house had been ransacked. The burglars had been in and took so much wealthy goods. So she was very upset at her doorkeeper. Doorkeeper, I asked you to look after this place. And she said, but I did, said the doorkeeper. I was very mindful. 
I saw the burglars going in and I noted burglar going in, burglar going in, burglar going in. I saw your jewelry going out, jewelry going out, jewelry going out. I saw the burglars go in again, burglars going in again, burglars going in again. I saw your safe going out, safe going out, safe going out. I was mindful, madam. Was that wise? Absolutely not. That's an example of what I call stupid mindfulness. It doesn't really get you anywhere, it doesn't do anything. But when you have good mindfulness, you're in this moment, and you're silent, especially in meditation, you know what you're doing or why you're doing it. Especially in meditation, you don't need to do anything. You're silent. And you are in this moment. And I know that that for many people is hard. And if you can't get that present moment and silence, the question is why? That comes to the heart of the meditation. So how do you get into the present moment, first of all? It's very difficult when people value the past and value the future more than they value the present moment. We always are told you will learn from the past. I don't know how old you are. This is my 72nd year on earth. I don't learn from the past. I learn from the present, from now, much more than the past. The past is done, cannot be changed. The present is where you are. You can have that awareness, strengthen that awareness and learn what it means to be here right now. And as for the future, you heard me say this so many times, the, the future is being made right now. If you care about your future, care about the future of the world, care about the future of your family, the only time you can do anything about that future is right now. So as I look at it, when I plan for the future, I'm actually neglecting it thinking what might happen, why it will happen. Because the future is, as the Buddha said, is so uncertain, so unpredictable. How many of you predicted COVID? How many of you predicted you know, the change in governments in the UK? Did you see that coming? How many of you predicted the incredible weather in November here, really warm? Could you plan for that? The problem with the future is we don't know what we're going to deal with. That's why the best way to plan for the future is actually be in this present moment and strengthen the power of your mind. And a good example of that is you know, when I did my final exams at Cambridge. It's a very clear example. I had one hour for lunch every day. An exam, three-hour paper in the morning, three-hour in the afternoon, day after day for six days, without any breaks in between. And that was stressful. But in the lunchtime, I wasn't a monk yet. I wasn't keeping eight precepts. I never had any lunch. I had a big breakfast and a big dinner. At lunchtime, I went back to my room, sat on a cushion, and meditated for half an hour. That's all. And the first thing which came into my mind as I closed my eyes was the morning exam, the past. Of course I did. That was a huge thing, I thought. I often joke, if I only had known I was going to become a monk, I wouldn't have worried so much about theoretical physics and quantum theory. But I never knew that at the time. So the first thing which came into my mind in the, uh, in the lunch break was how did I do in the morning exam? And it's obvious the exam has been finished, it's been handed in, there's no way I could change that at all. And so why worry about it? And so I could let that go because I had trained in meditation by this time. I could let go of the problem of the past. And when it came to the future, Again, I'd known by so many exams I'd done, and what I looked up 
no, a, a, an hour before the exam and the last minute swatting, as I used to say, would never, ever come up in the paper. It was such a waste of time. And instead, I wanted to be in this present moment. Because if you've ever done a three-hour exam in astrophysics of the galaxy, that's pretty heavy stuff, and your brain is exhausted. And I realized trying to think about the future exam, trying to plan it, will make me much more exhausted. So in order to prepare for the future, I realized the best thing I could possibly do was to be in the present and rest my brain so it could recover and become sharp and powerful again. And those are the things which I did. The full uh, example of that story was after coming into the present moment, I found I was physically shaking. I never ever thought I was a nervous person. A lot of times because I hadn't watched what I was doing. I was too busy out there in the world, remembering the past, planning the future. When you come into the present moment, you're aware of your own body, first of all, and it was shaking. It was the stress of doing these exams. Well, this was one of those first times when I could see what was happening. You could be aware of your body and relax it. But soon the body stopped shaking. And there's only a half an hour meditation. The last thing which I did notice was how exhausted I was. Doing examinations and worrying about them, my brain was working overtime. So now, instead of worrying, which would continue that tiredness, I just let the mind be. It's a beautiful thing to notice. And I learned that when I was only I was 20 when I did those final exams. And I've retained that skill ever since. When you are still, the energy of the mind starts to come back. The mind brightens up, it energizes. When I came out of the meditation only half an hour and then walked the afternoon exam, I can understand why now. All my friends, they didn't tell me the time, they told me afterwards. I was the only student who went into the afternoon exams with a smile on my face. I was relaxed and energized. And it just gave a lovely example of why that present moment awareness is important, not just in meditation, but in life, whatever you have to do. So how do you uh, enhance your ability to be in the present moment? That particular simile, I valued the, the present moment so much. And I saw the um, the unhelpfulness of the past, the uncertainty of the future. Basically, it wasn't worth being in the past or being in the future. I really needed to be in the present. And then when I gave it value, much more value than anything else, then the present moment dominated. Also in my life, I have found many times to be silent, not to give things names, not to try and capture anything, but to enjoy it, every moment of it. One of the examples of how I learned to be in the present moment and not capture anything or try and describe it with words it was when I decided, because I was a Buddhist, uh, this was in 1970. 71 or 72, no, 73. In 1973, I went to India on pilgrimage. I wanted to find the, the holy sites. And also, I had seen these wonderful images of the Himalaya mountains. And I just wanted to see them. Unfortunately, I did not do research. We didn't have internet in those days. Any research, you had to go to the library. So I went during the uh, the English summer, which was the wet season in India. So as soon as I arrived there, there's no way you could see the Himalaya mountains. They were shrouded in clouds. And after a while, I just gave up on the hope of seeing those, those mountains. But 
as I was traveling, went over into um, Nepal and Kathmandu, and then I heard at the youth hostel there was a postal service to the very north of Nepal. They had this truck, and even though you weren't supposed to travel in the truck, if you gave a few rupees to the driver, of course, he would carry you. So they, and it was up to the, the border between Nepal and Tibet. So I thought that was a really great idea. And there was two other Americans who were traveling with me. And when we got very close to the border with Tibet, that uh, he stopped for lunch. He said, we've got an hour. And so we saw a hill. We climbed on top of the hill. And when I got to the top of the hill, well, the clouds cleared. You could see the whole range of the Himalaya mountains. It was breathtaking. You know what I did? I ran down to the, the, the van to get my camera to catch this scene. This is absolutely true, very stupid. And it took a long time, maybe 20 minutes to get down, another 20 minutes to, to run up again as fast as I could. I was much more fit and healthy than I am these days. And by the time I got to the top, it was a great lesson I learned because just as I got to the top, the clouds closed in. And the two Americans have been sitting there all the time, not worrying about photographs. They turned around and said, where did you go? You missed it all. I went down to get my camera. And I lost that experience 100%. It taught me a good lesson. The beauty of nature, beauty of life, you cannot capture on a camera. You cannot capture at all. If you take notes, you miss too much. Even great poets, there's amazing ability with words. And sometimes they can catch experience like no one else can. But it's an imperfect capture of what's actually happening. So after a while, I started losing my trust in the ability of words, ideas, concepts to capture the reality. And I tried to capture the reality by thinking, by remembering. I just lost too much. So after a while, my confidence started to grow more in silent awareness. And as a monk, oh, that silence became so strong and so beautiful. When you're walking through a forest, you don't need to take notes. You don't need to think. No words can capture the beauty of a forest when it's still in the winter time I love in the UK. It's when Chitras Monastery was first built. I went over there about six months after it had been uh, brought. And it was in the middle of winter because I wanted to see my family over here in England during Christmas time. And, but this one day I had no duties. I was a visiting monk. And that day it was minus 16 degrees centigrade. And I saw the following morning when a newspaper arrived, the headlines on the Daily Mirror newspaper, if you know that one, was even the beer froze. That's how <laughs> newspapers in UK <laughs> try to make an image of really cold. But anyway, I had nothing to do, so I put on as many jumpers as I could find boots and went out into the forest. And that was one of those experiences which I will never ever forget. Yes, it was cold, it was beautiful. There was no sound of any aircraft overhead because you know, Gatwick, Keithrow were all closed because it was laden with snow. There's no sound of any cars because all the roads were blocked with snow. And only a crazy monk would be out there that time of the morning in such cold weather. Everyone else was either still in bed or in their houses in front of a fire. I had the whole forest to myself. Not even any birds flew in the sky. No squirrels scattered around in the undergrowth. It was absolutely motionless and soundless. When I stopped walking, the last crunch of my boots in the snow disappeared. 
and nothing moved at all. Almost perfect silence. That's why I stayed out there for a long time. Because that silence was something which was so pure, unsullied, and so calming. And that's to this day when I find quiet places, my mind just goes to them. That's why I like caves. Because in caves you can't hear the sound of any storm outside. You can't hear the sound of people talking. In the caves everything is subdued. And when you have silent awareness, and you experience that, then you know what mindfulness is. Fully aware. You're not distracted by noises or thoughts of past and future. Once you have that type of mindfulness, then if you want to do these meditations such as on the breath or loving kindness, or I don't know what other meditations you like doing, then it is easy. The reason why, say, mindfulness of the breath is difficult to some people is because they haven't prepared their mind in present moment awareness and silence yet. That's one of the reasons why in the Anapanasati Sutta, this is how the Buddha described the breath meditation. The first thing you do is to establish this mindfulness as a priority. Anyone who knows their party would never say to establish mindfulness in front of you. What the heck does that mean? Where do you live? Where is this you? You're supposed to put mindfulness in front of. It doesn't mean that. It means a metaphor. Put it in front. Priority. The first thing you have to develop. And once you've developed that mindfulness, then the rest of the meditation is a breeze. You're aware. The next thing to do is just to let the mind be with something like the breath. Honestly, I never focus on my breath. I never go looking for it. I let mindfulness become strong first. And then the breath comes to me every time. When it comes to me that way, it's always very peaceful, very delightful. So it's easy to watch. I never need to force it. It's just something wonderful to see. I never have to force my mind to see a sunset, beautiful sunsets. Because in Perth, my monastery is on this a big row of hills and it overlooks the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean is about 30 kilometers of plains until you get to the ocean. But you can still see it so clearly from my monastery. And some of the sunsets are amazing. An interesting point there, the best sunsets are when there's a bit of smoke or cloud on the horizon. You need that to be able to spread the golds and the purples and the yellows of the sunset. I always wonder why it is that when it's a perfect smoke or cloud-free day, the sunsets are never as beautiful. Imperfection is part of beauty. It causes it. So anyhow, when you have that silence, and that being a moment, then the mind is ready to meditate. It just happens quite easily. Of course, the preparation before, yeah, find a nice quiet place. Quiet places are hard to find in this world today. That's one of the reasons why, you know, whenever I teach, I have to be honest and I have to test myself first of all. Is that, is that, can you meditate there? And on one occasion, many, many, many years ago, our Burmese Buddhist community in Perth asked me to participate uh, in, it wasn't a violent or aggressive protest, but they wanted to bring people's attention to one of the times when I think many monks were being killed by the government in Burma. 
and that really upset them. And how can we make people more aware of this you know, without being violent ourselves? So in one of the busiest parts of Perth, Western Australia, it was right in front of a shop at those times called Time Zone. And Time Zone was a place where kids could play video games. And it was very, very loud music. And that's where we did our little demonstration on the on the uh, stairs or the st uh, stairs of a church on the opposite side of the road. And when I arrived, the organizers said, thank you for coming. First of all, thank you for being an English monk. So I arrived on time to the dot. And they said, we're just going to sit meditation for a couple of hours. No cushions, no mats, just on the pavement. Right opposite one of the noisiest parts of the city. And I thought, this is a lovely test. Can you get some nice deep meditation with all this noise going on around you? And so it wasn't that hard to be in this present moment. That was one of the most important parts of being able to be silent. Silence doesn't exist in the future or the past. It's only in this present moment. When you don't concern yourself with the past or future, it's not much to think about. And you can just be there, not naming anything at all. Because you weren't forming words, you couldn't have any negativity or any desire for anything in the future. You were just right there. And when you were right there, you soon got really peaceful. I thank the organizers afterwards because it was a test. It's one thing to be able to meditate in a nice meditation room or in this nice bhikkhuni vihara in Oxford. It's very quiet here. But to be able to meditate when there's so much noise around you, to find out you can do it was important for me. This is how you learn to be silent. If you can find a quiet place, it's easier. It's not necessary. One way of doing that is imagining a bubble around you. That's what I did in Suwanabumi Airport in Bangkok once. And I had to wait for an hour in a very busy place. And I decided to meditate. And so I imagined a bubble around me like a cave. There was no real cave there. I was just using my imagination. Inside was peaceful. You find that even though you're in one of the busiest places in Bangkok, you can still imagine that like you were in a cave and you got very peaceful and quiet. So those become the first two stages of meditation, mindfulness in the present moment and silence. For those of you who find it difficult to have silence, get in the present moment first, and then you will notice that's where silence lives in this present moment. And be kind to the present moment. Be confident with it. You find you don't need to think. When you do have that silence, you will soon, for yourself, appreciate the benefits of that silence. The silence becomes much more precious than anything else. At the moment, people who think they haven't experienced silence yet, is because you're afraid of the silence and you look at the past and the future as something more important to you. And after a while, the silence. is the best. I've done that to many people as an exercise. Started talking. And because people were interested in what I was saying, and when I stopped talking, they were waiting for me to carry on talking. I never did. How did that silence feel? And after a while, people got used to the silence. They could do it. They valued it. It was so much more beautiful and rewarding than all these descriptions which your teachers and your culture has added on to reality. It 
just there, peaceful and silent. Once that silence is established, of course, there's still something moving in your body. There's two things, the heartbeat and the lungs, the breath. If the heartbeat comes up, that's a bit of a distraction because if you calm your heartbeat too much, you're dead. So don't try calming your heartbeat, but calm the breath. You focus on the breathing, the only thing left moving. And soon that becomes very delightful. Remember what I said, I think, yesterday, when mindfulness does become strong, whatever you see, whatever you hear, whatever you smell, taste, touch or know, has this extra quality of happiness with it. Weird thing, but it's true. You can see much more of a tree in the forest when you're silent than you can when you're thinking about it. This is a delight which comes from silence and also the wisdom which comes from silence. So many great ideas groundbreaking ideas come when the mind is silent. You can see much more clearly. So anyway, the once you have present moment awareness, silence, then things like the breath come up by itself. And as the breath comes up, people keep asking, what do you do? Please don't spoil the whole process. Doing means you've lost the present moment and you're trying to get somewhere in the future. So please stay here, be silent, and just watch the automatic process of meditation. Meditation happens by itself. Your mind becomes more and more still. And as somebody was mentioning in the questions and answers last night, they didn't have much idea what a mind actually is. And that's quite worrying. And the reason I'm worried about that is not, nothing to do with you, it's our culture. There's too many people just deny even the existence of a mind. And I think I've mentioned many times that even in Greek philosophy, Aristotle always said there were six senses seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touch, and the mind. And the mind he called the common sense because everything you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, as soon as you touch something, you know you touch something. The mind takes on the old objects of the five senses and makes it itself, makes it one of its own objects. It happens fast, but when you are meditating, you can see that happening. It is what Aristotle said was a common sense. It takes the other senses objects and it has its own objects. So I often joke after so many centuries of Western culture, we always say we got our philosophy from the, you know, the Greeks, but in those years, we've lost our mind and abandoned our common sense. It has many meanings to it in that statement. But nevertheless, that caused our society so many problems. I was fortunate to be a physicist, a theoretical physicist, and the existence of a mind and observer becomes absolutely essential you know, for quantum theory. You have to have a known observer. It's not just uh, Greek philosophy, it's modern science, and let alone the philosophy of India and Asia, Buddhism and Hinduism. The mind is right there, it has to be. So how can you get to know your mind? First of all, you may have heard me when I gave the guided meditation yesterday, that you start off you know, with mindfulness, of your body, that just gets the mindfulness stronger, the more aware of the present moment because feelings in the body exist now. 
and develop the kindness as well, which makes it interesting to me right now. And try not to give it names. Because there's so many feelings in the body, so many pains. If there's any doctors here, how difficult is it when someone comes to you and says, I've got a pain in my body? So well, how does it feel? It's so difficult to explain because we don't have the language for that. There was this man who went to go and see the doctor and he said, you know, what's wrong? He said, my body hurts. What part of your body hurts, said the doctor? Well, look, it all hurts. The whole body is in pain. What do you mean, said the doctor? Well, when I touch my feet, it hurts. When I touch my leg, it hurts. When I touch my bottom, it hurts. When I touch my belly, it hurts. When I touch my head, it hurts. And the doctor was very smart. He said, the reason why your whole body hurts is because you've got a broken finger. And touch it if it hurts. Touch it if it hurts. In other words, you can try to see exactly what's going on. So, because of that meditation on your body, you actually get to be a little bit more aware, a little bit more still. And then there came a point in that guided meditation when I said, now let go of the body and just know how peaceful you feel. Why I said that is peace. Where does peace live? The times you are peaceful, it doesn't matter how peaceful, can you point to it for me? So the people, they just wrinkle their finger all over the place. It's here, no, it's not here. It's not your, your nose is peaceful or not your, your chest is peaceful. And the reason is because something like peace is a quality of the mind. By knowing one of its qualities, then you can start to recognize what this mind is. Just like if I want to point you to a garden, I would say, look, look at these flowers. Go find where the flower is, and then you know where the garden is. And this means that I'm pointing to an important part of your mind, peace. Once you find where peace lives, then you'll also find its neighbors, the rest of the wonderful things in the, this wonderful garden called your mind. So you just notice peace. Don't try looking for the mind. You become knowledgeable about the nature of the mind afterwards, once you get used to peace. And also with that peace, the silence. When you have peace and silence, you've got a direct contact with this thing you call the mind. Don't try and understand it yet. This is a vast, complicated thing. If you want to understand France, you don't just go to Paris. It's much bigger than that, but you start with Paris, maybe. And then from there, you can explore other parts of the great country of France. Once you go to, uh, to peace and silence, then it's like the doors of the mind are open for you. You can see much more. And so the next stage of the meditation, once you have some silence in your mind, it's not hard to keep silent because it's absolutely delightful. It's fulfilling, it's energizing. You get brighter and brighter, stronger and stronger. Of course, if you come into that place with silence, you, know, you will be tired. If you come in there with some, you rested, you slept well last night, and then when the silence comes, Delightful. Honestly, I love my meditation. People ask me when I fell in love. It was after the first meditation retreat. I fell in love with peace and stillness, not with human beings. Peace and stillness was so gorgeous. And that stillness is something you don't focus on. You can't stop seeing it because it is it grabs you, it draws you in. So that silent peace of the mind, that's where the meditation, I say, starts. It's joyful, happy, and you're watching this thing we call the mind. The breath often comes in. The breath is often just the stepping stone across the river from the body things to the mind things. Because as you're watching the breath, 
know, this in this way, you develop the mindfulness first, and then you can be aware of your breathing. As you're watching the breath, it should become more and more quiet, more and more peaceful. You don't have to note it. You don't control it. It settles down by itself. You're not doing very much, so you don't need to breathe so much. The amount of oxygen you, you need becomes lesser and lesser and lesser. So that's why it becomes more smooth. And soon you cannot notice the difference between the in-breath and the out-breath. This breath, and because there's hardly any difference, that becomes a time when the ambient breath gets so even, it disappears. You're not dead. You're just leaving the world of the, of the body and going to the world of the mind. The breath has done its job as far as it can take you. And then if you have developed a joyful breathing, a delightful breath, breathing, oh, this is nice. You're not afraid of that delight. Then that once the breath disappears, the delight stays. And I've often found it hard to use similes in the English language to describe this. And one of those similes is from Lewis Carroll and the Cheshire Cat simile. The Cheshire Cat simile was uh, Alice saw this cat appear in the sky. Actually, it was on, I think, a branch of a tree. And the cat kept appearing and disappearing. No, no, the whole lot disappearing, then the whole lot appearing. And said, Alice said to the cat, it's just very uh, confusing the way you come and go so fast. And so the cat, being kind, said, okay, I will disappear slowly next time. So the cat disappeared slowly, especially its head. You know, first, the, uh, the whiskers disappeared and the ears disappeared and the, the cheeks disappeared, and the nose disappeared, leaving only the lips smiling. And then the lips of the cat disappeared. And the only thing left with, was a smile, without any mouth to do the smiling. And Alice replied, I've often seen a cat without a smile. This is the first time I've seen a smile without the cat. And I thought that was a beautiful simile for what happens in this stage of meditation. Be watching the breath and it's very delightful. And the breath vanishes slowly, leaving only the delight. So that has become that part of meditation where we call nimittas, beautiful lights in the mind, appear. <coughs> There's lots to say about that, about the beautiful lights in the mind. That will take a long time in the future. I will talk about that. If any of you have those limited experiences, please let me know. Because they're gorgeous, powerful. You can take them into great stages of, of stillness and insight. This is how the meditation happens. So those are stages of meditation. But in brief, because I do have a glass of water here, I'll do the water simile. I think you can all see the water. That's okay, that's good. Now, my job in meditation, this water represents my mind. And my job is to keep this water perfectly still. Has it stopped moving yet? No. You know one of the reasons why? Because I'm not being mindful. I'm looking at the picture rather than the water itself. So now I'm looking at the water itself. Has it stopped moving yet? No. The reason is because I'm not concentrating. I will now concentrate. I mean trying. Every time I try, it moves more. There is a very easy way, and the only way to get this water to be perfectly still. I put it down. And I wait with that patience. 
After a few seconds, the water becomes perfectly still. I can never hold it that still. I can never make it that still. I put it down, let it go. And the stillness, which it is its nature, arrives. I don't do it. I let it happen. That's how we meditate. And because you put it down, that stillness can last for hours. There's no effort involved. It's delightful, beautiful, effortless. So those are the stages of meditation. Of course, people like to say, this is stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. But I say the stage of one half, two thirds, three quarters, one, one and a half. Please excuse me for not respecting uh, the idea of stages. I don't respect them because it's an approximation. You see how much can vanish, how much can disappear. The body disappears. Past disappears, future disappears. You can't feel anything, you can't hear anything. You're fully aware, and just any dullness of the mind disappears. You're really aware, and there's this natural happiness, this joy of an empowered mind. So that tiredness, negativity disappears. You have clarity. One of the things which disappears is this doing. Why do we always think we have to do something? Can't we just let go and rest? So if I rest, then what will happen? I'll tell you what will happen. You will become incredibly wise, even enlightened, joyful and healthy. It's not bad. Okay, so that's the little talk this morning about stages of meditation. <clears throat> so we can have 10 minutes of, of toilet break if you wish. Yeah. And then we'll do some guided meditation. Okay. So good day everybody. Ajahn Brown back here again. We're all back here again. And hello to all the live streamers. So in in cricket matches, you should have streakers. In meditation retreats, we have streamers. Is that right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> if you like to get your, your body ready and get yourself positioned for a lovely meditation, because it's one thing to teach meditation, but you learn so much more when you actually do it. So we have 50 minutes. Yeah, you do. Excellent. So what I will do with a 50 minute meditation, I will guide the first 20 minutes or so, but afterwards I like to you know, let you go because sometimes people they want to meditate quietly after a while. The guidance is just to get you in the right direction. And once you're in that right direction, then that direction is established. It's great to continue on. And again, as you are meditating in, when I'm not talking, just have this attitude of exploring. Just don't do anything, but just see what happens. Sometimes in these stages of meditation, you go to places you've never been before. Please never feel afraid. In all the years I've been teaching meditation, I haven't had anyone died from one of my meditation retreats. Never, not once. <laughs> So you are perfectly safe. In fact, you are more safe than if you're doing many other things in life. So when we get into, or when you get into deep meditation states, enjoy it. It's 150% safe. In other words, it's safer during the meditation, gives you safety afterwards too. So anyway, let's get started. So you find a nice comfortable position, what you think is comfortable as best you can. It's important to be kind to your body. I know that people think they have to rush. They haven't got time to be aware of their body. They want to go to the mind and they want to get enlightened. You know. But please, if you get enlightened on the first day of this retreat, 
what are you going to do for the rest of the days? Got nothing left to do. We don't give any money back. <laughs> so we just we sit down, and close your eyes, and experience your body. This is part of bringing up and strengthening your power of mindfulness together with kindness. So starting off with your legs. Now let's go even further. Starting off with your toes. I never thought you could be so aware of your toes. But after a while, when you ask your toes, how are you? You are making a new connection with that part of your body. And every time you do that, that connection gets stronger. And after a while, you can know how your toes feel very clearly. In the same way, I know how my nose feels. The awareness of the toes is just as strong. When I'm aware, of how my toes feel. The next step is very simple. I relax my toes. And how do you do that? Again, experiment. And soon you will learn how to notice the toes being more relaxed than usual. And that relaxation of your toes my ones anyway, always accompanied with a type of pleasure, a delight of relaxation, kind of a tingling pleasure, not a strong pleasure, but it's nice, delightful. And once I have that delightful feeling in my toes, and now I can go to the next part of my body, my feet, with the soles, the heels, the uppers, and all of the blood vessels and bones inside my feet. Mm. After a while, you can become aware of so many sensations in your feet. And this part of the practice, now just noticing your feelings in your feet, can help enormously when you do walking meditation. But right now, it's just building up the awareness and the kindness to relax your feet to the max. You move up to the ankles. How do your ankles feel right now? It's taking me a little bit longer today to feel my ankles. Now I can start feeling them. Specific sensation, I know. That sensation belongs in the area of my body called the two ankles. And I relax that feeling. Almost like wishing it to be at peace and at ease. And those kind, soft, gentle words do tend to relax that part of my body. If you've ever had a sprain in your ankles, or even a break, or any other bruising or wounding there. It helps heal everything. A lot of times we're too busy to be aware of our ankles. And now we specifically give them some time. Like everybody else, if I meet somebody, I just talk to them for two or three minutes, give them attention. They're so thankful. Like my ankles. They're so thankful that I'm giving them attention. They relax. And I go out my car the calves of my legs with the muscles in the back bones in the front, any blood vessels or ligaments in the skin as well. And as I'm moving my awareness up those legs, 
one of the purposes is to relax everything. You know? If you're going to meditate for a long time, it really helps when your body is so relaxed, you've given it attention, so it won't bother you with aches and pains later on. And once my awareness has reached the top of my calves, it comes into my knees. Because I spend so much time sitting on the floor, sometimes my knees start to ache. I can either stretch them out or just be aware of them. Relax every part of my knees. If I feel an ache or a pain there, I know it. And I kind of expand it. Expansion doesn't mean that the same and the severity of pain as goes to other parts of my body. I mean, it's like diluted, it's thinned. It doesn't hurt so much. And I wish it well, like with loving kindness. May my knees be at peace. And soon that kindness makes all the muscles in my knees relax to the max. And I send the awareness up to my thighs. Big muscles, not just the muscles, but the skin and the bones. And I thank my thighs. I'm grateful to them for keeping me up and erect. For allowing me to walk. Thank you, thighs. If there's any tightness there, I see what I can do to relax that tightness. Then I get to my butt my buttocks, my bottom. Heavy body, squashing those muscles on a thin cushion. And of course, there's a very clearly identifiable feeling in my buttocks. And it's important to notice, as long as that's as comfortable as you can make it, doesn't make the feeling disappear yet. But soon, that buttock feeling will vanish. Every time it does that. Now I've relaxed my legs from the buttocks down to the toes. Although today, I noticed I didn't spend enough time on my left knee, so I'm going to just adjust my posture. I do all those adjustments in the beginning, so it doesn't disturb me later on. Then I go off to my waist. You don't have to sit with the straight back to get into deep meditation. You have to have a comfortable back. But today I feel like my back needs to be really nice and straight. I, I actually stretch the back. It's like I see animals in the forest, even kangaroos, stretching their back. It's pleasurable. And once my back is stretched, then I let go. Let the back relax and it comes into a position which is great for meditation. And I also go once again down to the, the base of my torso. Now I want to go up the inside of my body, 
scanning it to see if I can pick up any any parts which need some extra attention. And so being a monk, often I you know, have some tightness uh, in the intestines of the colon. And I found out how easy it is to deal with that. Just be aware of it and be kind. That kindfulness relaxes everything. It makes my digestive system at ease. This is not just for physical health and physical comfort. It is a strengthening this power of the mind called kindfulness. Really strong awareness and kindfulness working together. Go up to my stomach, to my lungs, to every part of my body. And if there's women on this retreat who have breast cancer, you can pause on those areas in your body where there's tumor, where there's been operations. Pause and give it all the kindness you possibly can. That kindfulness has a huge effect. We go up to my shoulders. I like imagining my shoulder muscles like these bundles of strings on either side of the spine, and they're being pulled apart stretched by these invisible monsters. I allow those monsters to let go. And my muscles become at ease. And go down my arms. Relaxing everything as I go. I get to my hands and my fingers. When I started meditating, I wasn't aware of my hands. Now I'm checking, checking them out. My fingers are not in a good position. Oh no, I will adjust them. Took the opportunity also of adjusting my leg. My fingers. What is like just touching each other? And my thumbs. Slightly touching. And I go to my neck to make sure that my head is well balanced on top of the neck. And my face is relaxed. Muscles around the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Fully relaxed. Please excuse me, but Still, my leg is not comfortable, so I don't mind fidgeting as much as possible if I get that optimum position.
once my body is at ease, with mindfulness and kindness. Now I am ready to move to the mind. Not just all of the mind, but one particular feature of the mind. Peace. And I ask myself, how peaceful am I? I encourage you to do the same. How peaceful are you? To make it very clear, give it a number from one to ten. Ten means unpeaceful. Agitate. One means really peaceful. What number would you give a state of peace in your mind right now? And how to increase that peace, to get it closer to one. What disturbs your mind? This is where we're using our understanding, our insight to develop peace. The things like awareness of the past, all those troubles and problems that you've managed to go through, maybe they're still leaving bruises and scars on you. You've got through them so far. Now's not the time to think of them. It's like this example of a man who's carrying these two heavy suitcases. They've been carrying them for such a long time. They make the arms ache and the shoulders hurt. I'm sure you've all done that at airports or when traveling, carrying these two heavy either suitcases or maybe shopping bags. You look at the shopping bag in your left hand. This is just a meditation, uh, mental exercise. Imagine the shopping bag in your left hand. It's got these four letters on the outside. Right? That's the place where you bought the goods. Those four letters are P A S T. It's from the past. In that shopping, in that heavy shopping bag. But all those experiences from the past you carry around into the present moment. There are some good experiences in there. There's also some unpleasant experiences as well. You carry them around for such a long time, it makes your arms ache and your shoulders hurt. And you look in the shopping bag in your right hand, and that has got the letters F. U T U R E inscribed on the outside of the bag. It's in that shopping bag, it's full to the brim with all your hopes, fears, anxieties, and anticipations. It's so heavy to handle. It's made your right arm ache and your shoulder hurt. Now you feel those two shopping bags together, representing your past and future. Then you imagine yourself leaning to the left, allowing yourself to lower the shopping bag of the past closer and closer to the floor. When that shopping bag meets the ground, it is the ground takes a burden. There's no weight left. It allows you to uncurl your fingers from the handle of the shopping bag containing your past, moving your hand and your arm away from that bag, 
so your left arm and hand can hang loosely by your side. So even your shoulder can recuperate. You've let go of the past. Imagine a shopping bag in the right hand, really heavy, with the fears and anxieties about your future and the future of the world. Now you lean your body to the right, so you can lower that shopping bag to the ground. Slowly. And as that shopping bag meets the ground, the floor takes the weight. So you can uncurl your fingers from the handle of the right shopping bag to the future. Move your hand and your arm up by your side in its natural position, but not carrying the future. So your right hand can relax and recuperate together with the arm and the shoulder. And as you're standing there, between the two shopping bags, you notice you're not standing in the face of the past, that's the left of your left foot. So in the future, that's the right of your right foot. You're standing in this beautiful, re re relaxing place between the two shopping bags of the past and the future, called the present. Don't worry, because no one's going to steal those shopping bags. You pick them up later, but right now, relax in the present. You deserve it. If you followed that example, how peaceful are you now? The present moment is very, very, very valuable for you. And also for the people you live with. And for the work you do. Please respect the present. However you feel right now, don't try and describe it. Don't give it a name. Because those words are never accurate. You only need to take a photograph of it. You remember it. Trust in the memory of the beautiful experiences of your life. So we learn silence. Silent awareness of the present moment. No need to think or to make comments. So you really are silent. You can hear the birds singing outside in the garden. When you're thinking, you can't hear them. In that silent awareness, when it's strong enough, you'll be naturally aware of your breathing. Allowing the air going into your body. You know when the air pauses, it's enough in the body, so you don't breathe any more in. And after that pause, you can feel the earth, the breath leaving your body. It's the out breath. You don't make the in breath happen. You don't make the out breath happen. You are just this observer, the passive observer who does not interfere. Just 
watching the breath being oxygen into the body, and watching the lungs expel the used gases. You don't have to interfere because your lungs have been doing this for so many years. It knows much better than you how to do it. Your job is just to observe. Please also notice, hopefully, that this observing the breath without doing the breath can be very delightful. There's a pleasure associated with it. Which the Buddha specifically said not to be afraid of. It is the joy of watching the breath is like the glue which allows that awareness to continue for long periods of time. So I'm now going to be quiet about 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, I'll start speaking again.
close to the end of this meditation period, another five minutes. How do we feel? How peaceful are we? And what stages do we call happening for you? This is where we learn the most about meditation and practice and experience. How peaceful are you? When the mind becomes peaceful, how does that affect the comfort of your body? How does your body feel? And please observe three more breaths as best you can. At the end of the third breath, open your eyes. Comes the end of the meditation. So you have another, however long you need, so you have your lunch, and during that hour. You have developed some peace and stillness in the last meditation. Don't throw it away. Guard it. And do walking meditation. Or just go up and gently go to the toilet and come back and sit some more meditation. Just see how you can build up the momentum of peace. After a mind, a while, the mind enjoys the peace so much, it can stay with you. You can spend many joyful hours meditating in happiness and in peace. And once that stillness is strong, it's amazing how much awareness and wisdom and freedom eventuates. Please enjoy this small periods up to your lunch and afterwards. If you need to rest, rest. Be kind to your body, be kind to your mind. And guard the peace and happiness in your body and mind. And I'll see you later on this afternoon.